So thank you for the invitation uh, to be uh, speaking to you about nonviolent communication. This is something that is dear to my heart. I've been teaching nonviolent communication and working with people to teach, uh, working with people individually, couples, uh, for instance. And it's a process that really helps people connect. Uh, I just wanted to ask, and if people could just write in the chat if they're familiar with uh, nonviolent communication by Dr. Marshall Rosenberg. So there's a book written by Dr. Rosenberg. And um, and in fact, I brought Marshall Rosenberg to Ottawa in uh, the years 2004 and 2005. So, okay, I'm getting, nope, nope. All right, <laughs> some training. Yeah. So there's, it appears that there's more people who are not familiar with him. Okay. All right. Well, Marshall Rosenberg was recognized as an international peacemaker and he died, oh, I think it was about eight years ago now. And he was very grassroots in his approach. And one of the things that uh, he, he was so, so interested in, you know, how is it that conflict develops? Not that conflict in an in and of itself is problematic, but the way that we addressed, the way that we address conflict can be hugely problematic as, as you all know. And so he was traveling around the world and he started to look at the different ways that people do interact with each other. Now he was trained as a clinical psychologist, um, but when he branched out and started to look at language specifically, he discovered a lot of things and nonviolent communication has become a tool recognized worldwide. And it's a very active in communities where, you know, it, you know, he used to spend time in war torn countries. Uh, he, he had spent time in Palestine, you know, decades ago. And, you know, unfortunately there, there continues to be so much a strife and uh, pain and suffering in much of the world. But this is a process that helps us to recognize why does it happen to begin with? Why is it that we develop enemy images? So that's one significant part of the training is to recognize, boy, when we have enemy images, we need to stop right away and uh, recalibrate and look at what's happening inside of us. And so there's Two components to nonviolent communication. One of them is, is how we express ourselves, revealing our own honesty to another person. And the other is how we listen empathically to someone. So those are the two things that we're always monitoring that are going on. And I'm going to do a very quick run through of alienating communication because one of the things that I've found so profound in Marshall's teaching was not only a process to help us to connect, but recognizing the ways in which our culture educates us to disconnect. So I would feel quite comfortable saying that there's much in our world, uh, in our society, in the modern society, that puts us in um, an anti-relational stance vis-a-vis -vis each other. And so just to recognize that that's going on is, is hugely important in my opinion, because otherwise all we're doing as trainers is providing a model to put on top of an existing model that is anti-relational. I hope that makes sense to people. So what is it that is, uh, we'll say anti-relational? We have something that's called the four Ds of disconnection. And this you will find in the handouts that I have supplied you don't have to look at it now, but it is there available for you after after we spend our time together here. So it's called the four Ds of disconnection. And so diagnosis is the first thing that people will often do that gets in the way of us seeing another human being. And it requires a certain way of thinking. We think in terms of good, bad, right, wrong, appropriate, inappropriate, normal, abnormal. And then we have certain uh, adjectives that we might use, for instance, manipulative, controlling, dismissive, uh, narcissistic, uh, racist, whatever it is, as soon as we describe a person in those terms, it's very hard for us to connect with them. And it'll be very hard for them to hear us because all of their resistances will kick in. 
their defense mechanisms will kick in. So, so that's the first one is the way that we uh, judge each other. And it's very important for me to add here that judging in itself isn't isn't a negative. We can't get through the, the day without judging. We have to make decisions about things. Is it safe to cross the street right now, for instance? You, you're monitoring for threats and, and wanting to be safe. So our body is set up that way, but it's the kind of moralistic judgments that are problematic. So in NBC, we're striving for discernment, which is uh, very different than to be judging a person based on moralistic uh, judgments and thinking. So that's the first one. That's the first way that we disconnect. The second one is when we place demands on people. Now, I'm going to guess that some of you have kids. And the second we make a demand on another person, uh, isn't it true that the resistances come up automatically? You hear the word, no, I don't want to. I don't feel like it. And this often occurs when someone has positional power, such as a parent or a teacher, uh, a boss, anybody who has some level of uh, power, say over you, can bring up those resistances. You don't even have to have that happening too. Anybody who's married recognizes this as well. You can be on equal footing and one person suggests that you do something and suddenly you don't want to be cooperative. So this is something that kicks in and it's really important to recognize that. So the demand thinking, it doesn't mean that we should get rid of hierarchy because there are hierarchies that are in fact very healthy and necessary. You know, a parent does know more than a child about many things. And so it's important that we recognize that it's not to not to get rid of that, but how can a parent speak to a child or a boss to uh, to a, a subordinate so that it it pulls up their natural inclination to want to be collaborative, which is in nonviolent communication understanding the most natural thing in the world. That that's what we would love to do. We really want to be collaborative with each other because it's just way more fun. It's just more fun in the end. So there's. There's that aspect. So that's the second D of disconnection. The third one is denial of personal responsibility. And this is when we, we use language that basically makes it appear like we don't have any uh, choices around things. We have to. It's company policy. There's no other way. Those are the rules. That's just how it is. So that kind of language uh, removes any accountability or responsibility from us because we just get to blame it on whoever it is, the government who makes me do it, uh, whoever it is that makes me do it. And so we want to recognize that that kind of language puts us into the victim position or uh, certainly someone who doesn't have any power, which is not the case. We're trying to uh, have people see that, in fact, they do make choices. We make choices every single moment about what's important to us, whether we are alert to it or not, we are doing this. There's another aspect too around the denial of personal responsibility and it's how we talk about our feelings. Maybe you've said this before and uh, you've probably certainly heard it before. When somebody says to you, you make me so angry, now what I'm saying is that you are responsible for my feelings. And in fact, we are responsible for our own feelings. So in NBC, we're encouraging people to take responsibility for their feelings. This doesn't absolve others of their responsibility or um, just and responsibility for their actions and their impact because we impact each other. We are interconnected. But it's to recognize that what another person says or does, that would be the stimulus for what comes up for us. If we have feelings about something, the person is stimulating that, but the cause of it isn't the person, it's what we value. If I value respect and I see someone doing something that I would describe as not meeting needs for respect, 
I might feel something. There's a good chance I will if I'm connected to my needs and to my feelings. I'll recognize, oh yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling frustrated, feeling angry, whatever it is that we're feeling. So, um, so that's the third one, denial of personal responsibility. And the fourth D of disconnection is deserve thinking. This is when we believe that other people's uh, actions deserve you know, to be punished or rewarded. And what this does is it motivates people extrinsically instead of motivating them intrinsically. So nonviolent communication is a language that urges people to take responsibility for their own actions and to do things because they recognize why it's important to do it. So you become self-motivated as opposed to being uh, motivated by the threat of punishment or the possibility of reward. So those are the four Ds of disconnection. And in the NBC understanding, what happens is when that is employed or that dynamic is what's occurring between people, whether it's interpersonally or within an organization, people are acting either out of submission or rebellion, not out of goodwill or the, a positive engagement. They're coming from a place of submission or rebellion. And we wanna get out of that particular loop because it's, uh, it, 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 it creates resentment between people which eventually erodes uh, the goodwill of the relationship. Marshall Rosenberg used to say, never say the following to another person or allow them to say it. And here's what it is. All right, I'll do it. Because anytime <laughs> you say something like that, you know, you're gonna pay for it. Because that's, you, you can hear the resentment in it, but we're so used to it. We're just so accustomed to going that route. So you want to, you know, stop people. If you hear them saying that to you, you would say, well, wait a second. I want you to do it because you see why it's important to all of us and to you included to do it. Not out of this place of resentment. So Marshall Rosenberg used to uh, write songs and he had a guitar when he traveled around the world. And one of the songs he wrote was based on an exchange he had with his son, Brett, who at the time was 16 years old. And I'm gonna recite that to you because to me, it illustrates everything that I've just mentioned in these four Ds of disconnection. It goes like this. If I clearly understand you and tend no demand, I'll usually respond when you call. But when you come across as a high and mighty boss, you'll feel like you ran into a wall. And when you remind me so piously about all the things you've done for me, you better get ready. Here comes another bout. Then you can shout, you can spit, moan, groan, and throw a fit. I still won't take the garbage out. Now, even if you should change your style, it's going to take me a little while before I can forgive and forget. Because it seems to me that you didn't see me as human too until all your standards were met. I love that poem. <laughs> I love it because it just so, so succinctly and beautifully illustrates this dynamic that happens between us. That's so tragic, isn't it? You know, uh, you've probably all been on the giving and receiving end of that. Uh, but the thing that I love about that particular piece is how it highlights it. So it's a kind of a gotcha moment, you know? Oh yeah, so this is what happens to us. And nonviolent communication helps us to catch ourselves so that we can do something different. We get to choose differently. And that, that's why I fell in love with this process. You know, I was married. My kids were, I believe, about eight and uh, 12 years old when I met Marshall. And I was just so struck with... Oh, this could, this could change everything. This is such a game changer. And I mean, I went home at the end of the first day of the workshop with Marshall and my husband looked at me, said, so how was it? And I just burst into tears uh, because it felt like I've been looking for this for so long now because I figure there's gotta be a better way. 
human beings, I believe, are fundamentally uh, good at heart, that it's just way more fun. It's way more rewarding and satisfying and healthy and good for the world when we know how to speak with each other in a way that's more likely to uh, facilitate connection. Now, the thing is, we're human beings and uh, we we have dif we have differences. Um, oh, Marshall, I'm getting asked the question, Marshall Rosenberg. So he wrote the book, Nonviolent Communication, A Language of Life. And he is the founder of the Center for Nonviolent Communication, recognized worldwide as an international peacemaker. He's no longer living. He died in 2015 at the age of 80 years, years old. But this is a very powerful body of work that he created. And there are trainers uh, around the world. So, and I'm one of them. Um, okay, so so that's the what disconnects us. And I'd like to ask, does anybody have any questions about this part before I shift over? So I, I see, I think it's Ed who says, I think the diagnosis recipe for alienation does get used a lot in long-term care sometimes. Could you elaborate on how we as a team can avoid the rightness, wrongness, good, bad <laughs> use sometimes? Well, <clears throat> sure. I, 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 hopefully the time that we're spending here together, I'm about to shift into that of what we can do instead of the diagnosis. Um, so it's it's a very good question. And 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 I recognize, you know, I do recommend that anybody who's interested in this, you know, get the book. the The book, Nonviolent Communication, is is a a very useful book to have. Okay. Can you see me all right? I'm just noticing it's getting dark here, and I don't have lighting. Otherwise, uh, yeah. So I'm just gonna you. We can see you clearly, Rochelle. Okay, good. Okay, super. All right. Okay, so what are our options instead of the diagnosis, the four Ds of disconnection? Well, the model has four different steps. Now, this is a consciousness we're actually looking at, but right now I'm gonna go into a model that provides four steps and we're going to imagine a situation where you don't like what's happening and you want to be able to address it, to bring some attention to it and see if you might resolve it. So the first step is to make a clear observation of what the other person is saying or doing that's um, not meeting your needs right now. And the second one is to say how you feel. The third step is to state what your needs are in the context of what's unfolding. And the fourth step is to make a clear doable request. Now, this sounds very easy. I, I'm imagining it sounds very easy to do, but it, in effect, it's incredibly challenging. It's incredibly difficult to do. And the reason it's difficult is because of what I just told you about before. It's because that operating system that we have, if you will, or that template, you know, uh, one of the objections that people sometimes bring to me about nonviolent communication is the following. They say, I don't, I don't want to use a model or a formula when I'm speaking. <laughs> to which my response is, well, what makes you think you're not using a formula? You use a formula. Typically, when we don't like what's going on, if we're going to say anything about it, our formula is, I'm going to diagnose. That's typically what we do. We're going to get into the play the game who's right. And that is the formula. So but we're so used to it and it just feels so automatic. You don't think about it. But with practicing, um, just as in any you know, uh, body exercise, yoga, you practice something over time, then that becomes your new spontaneous uh, form of expression. And so, so what I wanna do with you is to review each of those four steps. And we wanna make sure that we understand what each step is. So that for, first step is to uh, to say what the other person is saying or doing that we don't like. And 
let me see if right now, if you could think of a scenario, maybe it happened to you earlier today uh, or sometime in the past week, somebody was doing something and it was really bugging you. Um, could you write down in the chat just what it was? There, these would just be, you know, short sentences. What are the or what are the types of things that people do that really bug you? You want me to read them out as they come in? Would that be helpful? sure? Yeah. Trying their hardest not to do not to do any work or task which makes my life harder. Noise, asking the same question repeatedly. They get mad at me at work over something I have no control over, expecting us to step up and rescue them. Um, I'm trying to explain something and the other person is rolling their eyes, speaking over me, complaining all the time. When you're on the phone and someone enters the office and starts talking to you, avoiding me, talking about other residents when they are present in long-term care. Okay, that's a pretty good list. Okay. okay. So, uh, excellent. So thank you for, for writing these things down. Some of them you'll want to tweak a little bit, at least if you want to get them to be in alignment with what is an NVC observation. So I want you to imagine that whatever you wrote down, you're telling the person who's connected to it, or maybe who's, you know, who's engaged in the behavior that you don't like. Do you believe that that person would say, yes? Uh, let me give you an example. Would, you know, if you said you're avoiding me, would the person say yes? They may or may not agree with that. So what you can do then is get really specific about what is it that they're doing or saying that leads you to the conclusion that they're avoiding you. Can you see the difference there? Because sometimes we think someone is ignoring us, avoiding us, and that's actually not what they're doing when we unpack the whole thing. And we find out in fact that they were uh, either very um, focused on something else, some other activity, they had a sore stomach, they had to go to the bathroom, whatever it is that, that we find out. But we're so quick to interpret. We we overlay our our own um, diagnosis of what's going on. So this the first step to make the clear observation is to help us clean that up. So uh, let me see. I'm just going to look through these and and name one that I see as doing um, doing exactly what I said. Okay, my daughter's chatting online when there are dishes to be washed. Okay. See, your daughter isn't going to disagree with that. She is chatting online and there are dishes. Uh, now you're connecting the dishes <laughs> with her that she's supposed to do that. But I, I want to just say, this is a clear observation. Um, you know, you can just say, so daughter, I noticed that you're chatting online and there are dishes to be washed, you know, and, and I'm going to guess that there has been a conversation about her doing the dishes. And I'm going to guess that you have a need in this particular case that uh, agreements that are made uh, between family members are going to be honored. So uh, that, that's a need that every human being has, you know, is that when people agree to do something, that they'll follow up on it, that they will do it. It doesn't mean it always happens, but it does mean that it's a need. So I just wanted to get very clear about that, that, uh, that observation. Here's another one speaking over me. I would tweak that just a little bit um, to say the person starts speaking before I finish. You know, uh, it takes a little bit out of the, st the stigma out of it because in our culture, you know, we, we don't appreciate interruption. And yet there are cultures where it seems to be perfectly okay to interrupt. <laughs> so... Uh, so we want to get very clear on what is actually occurring. Um, There's another one here, Rochelle, if I could just throw it out. So um, it's asking for um, you to sort of provide some ideas. So if I had a colleague who was using infantilizing talk or baby talk with a resident with dementia, how could I make an observation comment in line with that, in line with NBC for that? 
Oh, okay. Great question. I would probably repeat exactly what the person said. I I would say, you know, I I overheard you speaking with this patient and hearing you change your tone of voice and saying, you know, little missy, I, you know, whatever it is that you're you're saying. Uh, so I would say that. By the way, I want to say something here. It's really important to say. Um, just because you do this, if you start to adopt this practice, it doesn't mean that people turn around and look at you and say, oh, I just love the way you're speaking to me. And yeah, I'm be, be very happy now to give you whatever you would like. That's not what happens. But what it does do is it makes it, it keeps people on their side. You know, you stay on your side of the line and you start to recognize um you start to see your own patterns and you see that the things that that irritate you and you become more empowered and capable of speaking with a person. The other piece we're going to look at is the empathy. You want to be able to empathize with the person. The person who's doing that is doing it for a reason. Uh, it may not be the best choice, but they're doing it because they probably believe in some way that this is um, is is the best way to be with this person. Who knows? But you want to enter into a conversation that brings you into that place. So the person's doing it for for a reason. Maybe they feel more connected when they're doing it, and you're kind of looking at it, cringing. Oh no, yeah. So. So I hope that answers the, the question, but we're going to want to get to what's the next step is how are you, how do you feel about that? And before I, I go to that, that is the second step. And I'm presenting them in this order, although in a conversation, you would be more, you know, could go through it more organically. I, I What's important for me to say here is that what makes NVC so mm, powerful is the third step is the needs. It's recognizing that everything that people say and do, they're doing it for a reason. They're trying to fulfill a need. And in the NVC understanding, we humans share the same needs. So in a longer workshop, I would invite you to generate a list of needs. Um, I've already supplied you with one that's a separate sheet, the feelings and needs. But what we would find is if we had the time to do this together in the group, um, it, you know, groups of five, for instance, you would create these lists. And when you looked at them afterwards, if we pin them up against the wall, on the wall, you'd see, wow, we all wrote the same thing pretty much. So human beings have a need for things like, you know, love, connection, honesty, trust, meaning, purpose. Those are the needs. And in the list that you have, you'll see there are probably about 60 some needs that are there. So in the NVC process, we want to bring everything back to the needs. And why this is so powerful is because needs, as well as being universal, there isn't a need I have that you don't have. And so this is what starts to build the bridge, you know, create a currency between our hearts, because so often in a conflict situation, we're focusing on differences. But when you bring the needs into the picture, then you have something, a, a way to, you know, extend an olive branch if you could out to that other person. So like, let's just look at that particular situation, you know, the, the, the baby talk with a resident with dementia. I'm going to guess that you both have a need for this person to uh, to feel good, you know, to whatever degree the person can, and that you both want to also um, enjoy your exchanges with the patient. So in that sense, you share the same need, but you have very different strategies about, about it and a different belief systems about it. But if you bring the need into it, it's so helpful. And because you look at those needs words, they're all positive. They're all positive. So this is a way to inject positivity into the exchange. So I wanted to, th that is the third step. Now I'm going to go back to the second step about feelings. 
And I am going to give you a little bit of an exercise here. So I'm hoping that everybody can have a look at that. Uh, if we go to uh, the, the fourth page of your handout. So everybody got that? I just want you to look at the two lists of feelings there. I have list A and list B. List A has words, the words excited, anxious, discouraged, afraid, angry, sad, surprised, and frustrated. And list B has the words disrespected, manipulated, betrayed, unappreciated, abandoned, judged, ignored, unloved. And I'd like you to uh, say something about how they're different from each other. And if you, you can write that down in the chat if you would like. Because these are, even though people will say, I feel before they use these words, they're distinctly different. Okay, someone has written that the list, uh, one, one of the lists is descriptive, the other is judgmental, yeah? So everybody can see the list right now. Okay, as long as everybody can see it, I, I uh, thank you for the responses that you're putting in the chat. Okay, so judge, uh, list A is descriptive, the other is judgmental. And then list A is more self-reflective, list B is more relational. Okay, so I, I wish I could ask the person who, I think what you're meaning is that it requires that the other person be there. I'm going to say for our purposes that relational means it will connect us and list B is actually not going to connect us. What, what list B is in terms of linguistics, it's a description of what we believe the other person is doing. That's what it's doing. Whereas list A is actually feelings. Another little trick you can uh, use with this is if you can draw an emoji, you can draw emojis for the words on the, in list A, but you cannot draw emojis for list B that would be instantly recognizable by people. Yeah. So, so super important when we're describing feelings that we actually describe feelings and not how we believe others are treating us. Now in the uh, handout of feelings and needs, you will see there's a box at the bottom of the page that has a more extensive list of list B types of words. You know, I feel abandoned. I feel put down. Um, it's a, it's a pretty extensive list. And I do encourage people to study that list and circle the words that they tend to use more often than not with those who are closest to them. And also maybe use a different color pen to circle the words that those who are closest to you use when talking to you, because you'll learn a lot from, from that. Um, just in case anybody doesn't, um, isn't quite convinced about what I'm saying right now, that <clears throat> Lispy is not a description of feelings. I just wanna make clear that when people use the words on Lispy, they usually <clears throat> emote quite a bit. So it's not that there isn't a lack of feeling. It's simply that it doesn't describe feeling. And if you were to get an email where people were using words from list B, you actually wouldn't know how they were feeling. But if they use the words in list A, you would know how they were feeling. And um, just one more little piece around that. I can say to you, I feel disrespected. In fact, I'll say it to you twice. Um, and, and then I think it will clarify any doubts that people have. <clears throat> so I feel disrespected. Here's the second one. I feel disrespected. Okay, hopefully that clears it all up. 
I didn't tell you how I, how I felt, but I used that word. And what I did tell you was what my need was. So respect is the need, but it doesn't describe feeling. And human beings are so, like, we have so many feelings. And I think you'll find that so often we're quite uh, feeling illiterate. You know, we usually have about five feelings. You know, I'm hungry, I'm mad, I'm sad. Um, that Those types of words. Uh, but if you, their feelings are quite nuanced. And we can be feeling many things at the same time. So when you're wanting to strike up a conversation with this other person and you start with your clear observation and you state your feeling, you choose one or two. You know, don't overwhelm the person uh, with all of the feelings. What's important is to get to the need. So I'm going to again return to this one about the, the baby language. When you use that language with... Um, a patient who is 80 years old, I feel, I feel sad and frustrated because I have a need for respect and their dignity. And, and then you would make a request, you know, which might be, I, I want to make sure you're not hearing this as blame or criticism. Can you tell me what you are hearing me say right now? That would be a possible request that we would make. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to review that piece around feelings. I think that you'll find it will make a huge difference in uh, what happens in your relationships. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about that? <clears throat> Abandon is not a feeling. No, not in, not in our NVC understanding. Uh, abandoned is what we think another person has done to us. So what would be a corresponding feeling would be, I feel alone. I feel hurt. I feel confused. So, and you notice that the word abandon, it puts the emphasis on what another person is doing and not on what's happening in here. You know, you can, you could be angry. You could be furious at the thought of the person abandoning you. So it really doesn't tell us about how a person is feeling. Yeah. Yeah, I see Rochelle. We got two people with their hands up. So I'm okay. Great. Guessing that yes. um, here is it okay if I stop sharing for a second? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, okay. that's great. Yeah. So, I think everybody got that part. <laughs> yes. So um, I can give you if if having your hands up means that you want to have your video and audio on here, I'll invite you to talk here. Did you have a question? Wonderful. Yes, I have a question. Um, just Thank for you. clarification, I was writing down uh, when you were speaking, Rochelle, and I missed what you said. The list A is emotions or feelings, and, and the, the B list, you had one word for it that I missed. Interpretations. Interpretations. Well, Thank so you. So that's our interpretation of what another right. person is doing. And, you know, and not everyone will interpret what that person is doing in the same way. So it's it's very subjective, right? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. There's a comment in the chat box, Rochelle, where someone has said that it's good to have a framework like this because we are usually lacking a vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So so now you have that feelings and needs list. I mean, that is the that is the vocabulary because Nonviolent communication is really about sharing what's alive in us. We we are educated primarily in, in using static language. And but yet we're alive human beings. So the question becomes like, what's alive in you right now? Not how are you diagnosing the world and and people in it, including yourself, but what's alive in you? So it requires a, a, an awareness of what goes on inside of us and also a vulnerability uh, to, to share it because sometimes it's not easy. People are much more likely in conflict situations to present their armor. That's, that's typically what we do. And when you saw the words in less B, those are armored words. They're not, they're not sharing a vulnerability. In most of those words, people feel hurt 
or afraid. Yeah. There's another comment here, Rochelle. Well, um, Heather said, ooh, I like that. Mm. Um, <laughs> and then Mike, I believe, says, I have a teenager and he occasionally, okay, let's be honest, daily has lots of big feelings. This mm -hmm. vocabulary is really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yeah, I have found that, that that feelings, really understanding the feelings to be huge, huge. I remember on one occasion presenting to a group of uh, social workers, and this was, you know, before the pandemic, it was live, there were about 100 people. So I had people sitting at their tables doing this exercise, as I just asked you to do. And I remember when we came back to the large group, to discuss it, there was someone at the back of the room and she yelled out, she says, holy shit, this changes everything. So, and I would agree, it does. I found it incredible learning because that that victim language, it's so easy to hook onto it. And it somehow makes us feel stronger, but it actually pushes away the very thing that we're wanting, which is the connection, connection. yeah. I remember my biggest aha moment, Rochelle, when I first was exposed to nonviolent communication. And one of the reasons I wanted to pursue it to share with other healthcare workers was as social worker, we're taught to, to express feelings. Mm -hmm. But I used to say things I learned afterwards. I used to say things like, I feel like you. I feel oh, yeah. like you don't want to do this, or I feel like you're not interested. Or I, and so it was really helpful in nonviolent communication to have a list of feeling words. Uh, when you express a feeling and it has to be, I feel sad. I feel lonely. Yes. Yeah. Know, say the and, feeling word. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope everybody's paying attention to what Tara just said about the like, because that that's also included in your handout under the feelings that whenever we use that, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I do that still after all these years, but I'm aware I'm not describing feeling when I do that. Yeah. So. I see we have Linda with her hand up as well. Linda, okay. I'll, I'll give you permission here to within the Zoom here. Are you able to? Hey there. Perfect. Hello. I find two very important phrases that I use a lot are I need and I I rather not or I prefer that. And I find that that helps me a lot. Do you have a question, Linda, as well? No, I just wanted to, to mention that that, that okay. is what I find helpful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, yes. I just, you know, talking about needs, I want to um, just clarify here that when we want when we talk about needs we also want to make sure that we are talking about needs we're going to go to the fourth step which is how to make to make a clear request you ask for something that you would like um and the thing that makes nvc really um challenging too sometimes is that when we're making the request we have a very strong or an, an expectation that the person will give it to us and in NBC, our understanding is when we ask something of someone, they have every right to say no to it because, and the no would be that there's there's a reason why they're saying no, because it wouldn't meet their needs to do whatever it, it is that we've asked. So I, I just want to make clear that if the word to follows the word need, it is not a need, or actually I need or I need you, okay? If the word you follows the word need, it's not a need, it's a strategy. Does that make I sense? Do. I need you to clear the table. You know, by the way, when I say things like this, I'm not saying never say this again, okay? I just, just I, I don't wanna come in with a, you know, to replace one dogmatic way of doing things with another one. <laughs> so that's not what NBC is. It's just simply having an awareness that what we're trying to do is facilitate uh, uh, collaborativeness between people. And so I wouldn't say I need you to, I would recognize that I'm confusing needs with strategies right then and there. So just wanting to- make Right, sure. more of a, I need the situation to be, like not 
putting it on the other person, but mm-hmm. expressing what my need is so that the other person can understand that either the situation is being aggressive towards me or mm-hmm. that the situation is escalating. So mm-hmm. I find that using the word need helps the person recenter on what they're trying to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I'm guessing that you're choosing one of the words that's part of the needs list in, in doing that. That would be my guess, if, especially if you're getting a positive result mm-hmm. or, or there's just something about you. <laughs> um, there are a few things coming into the chat box. Okay, like okay. Sure go there. Okay, Tina has asked um, any videos of people demonstrating these communication techniques stuck at home sick at the moment? Uh, sure, there's a lot. I mean, uh, I've on my website, uh, I've got a, a page on NVC. And I mean, I would recommend non, I would look up Marshall Rosenberg. That's who I, you, there's, there's lots of him teaching. Yeah. So I would look that Thanks, up. Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. A comment that people. I, I'll, I'll just mention too, I'm going to be doing a, a four week training uh, coming up uh, starting in February, which is listed on my website as well. It's online. So anybody's welcome. Um, or if you would like to come to BC in May, I'm doing a five day a residential training. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So there's also a comment in the chat box that people at the in the workplace have become less expressive. Mm hmm. Um, Someone has shared that this is so thought provoking and helpful, wondering if the handouts will be emailed out and comment saying, I think we all say things because we've always said it or hear others say it without realizing it may be our word that maybe our word choice can trigger a negative reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then a comment here, this might be a bit off topic, but do you have any sage wisdom or ideas from an NVC perspective on how to disrupt the Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Script. I feel that it falls into static vocabulary category and I'm perpetually on the lookout for ways to not engage in it that doesn't feel rude or unprofessional. Well, you know, there's many ways to share what's alive in us. I I guess I, you've established some context there, but I'm not sure is it, you know, you also use the word, you you don't want to engage in it because it could be rude or unprofessional. Um, I would, I would need to hear more from you about that, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking about like what comes to mind right now is uh, remember Forrest Gump. Okay. That film. It's a lot about the energy. You know, if someone says, Hey, how are you? You know, when they come right up to you <laughs> real close. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you do that, but I am I am just simply observing that in that exchange, you get a real sense of the exchange of aliveness in that. So, so much of it just has to do with our own energy. I And I want to shift over here to the um, the empathy part, because I've just given you uh, four steps of how to reveal your own honesty and to start the conversation when something is is not going the way you would like. But I don't imagine that when you do that, you'll always get a, a, an immediate positive outcome. So you have to be prepared for the fact that someone will object or say, well, I don't see it that way or or why don't you do it or whatever it is that they're going to say. And in that moment, we would want to be able to empathize with that person's reasons for saying no or objecting. And here's here's the line we would have. Are you feeling, and we would describe the feeling that we are reading from them because you need. And nine times out of 10, you know, when you're going with the empathy, you will find that people will become less agitated. You'll see it in their body. They kind of start to feel like, oh my gosh, you got me. Like, you understand me. I don't have to be resisting now because you understand what I'm saying. 
Yeah, Rachel, they let me come up. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And that's actually quite helpful. What I was speaking more to was like, I talked to a lot of people in a day and the greeting, the like a common greeting in Western society now seems to be, hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Like just as a hello. Yes. And, I, and I'm always looking for ways to not fall into that. Cause like, I wanna, I wanna either really answer the question and engage in authentic conversation mm -hmm. or like just kind of like not get caught up in that script you know of 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 using hi how are you good how are you as a hello and I, I just I'm always curious I when I when I have the opportunity to hear from people that are you know uh, well practiced in in good communication um, if you have any tips on like how to interrupt that or like respond in a way that opens up the opportunity for deeper connection and and so I think you did speak to that so thank you so much mm -hmm. I, I will add more to it is that you know when Marshall was uh, traveling around delivering his workshops one of the things he would say is he said you know what three of the most beautiful words in the English language are how are you which is I, I recognize myself how that becomes so just kind of performative, but it's a way of recognizing like you, you who have been through so much, like, how are you? Um, the thing is, I think so often we're saying it, uh, put, put it this way, given the choice between having someone say, how are you as they're passing me in the hallway and saying nothing and it's someone that I know or have some, you know, limited connection with, I would prefer the how are you, even though I recognize that it's not a genuine question because they probably don't have time to hear how I am. Do you, like, the, you know, often what comes up in us is, do you really want to know? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's deeply personal, I would say. Um, it's, it's, I like to simply recognize that, hey, you know what? Everyone is probably uh, is suffering on some level. Every single person is suffering on some level. And I hope that in the short, brief period of time I have, that, that the person has a sense that I know that, that I recognize that, even if we're not going to get into it. Yeah. But, you know, the fact that to me, the fact that you ask the question tells me that it's you, you have a presence there when you are in an encountering another person. And so I would say, keep asking the question and let it direct you. Yeah. I hope it's a, I know it's not a fully satisfying answer, but. Well, that's, that's, what, that's what I, that's what I got right now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So I'd like to give you an opportunity in that handout that I gave you, I, you know, the fourth page at the very end, it says applying the NVC process. So expressing honesty, which is when I see in here, this is the template you you put what the observation is, I feel, you put in the feeling because I need and or long for, and would you be willing? That's, that is the template. And then responding empathically is, are you feeling because you need? And, you know, just given the amount of time that we have, I, I would just encourage you to think of a situation fairly recently where someone has said something to you that you were, you know, you were troubled by, and let's see what you could come up with to respond empathically. How do you think this person was feeling when they said or did what they did? And what do you think their need was? The thing is, we don't need to be right. It's not about that. It's about being interested and curious. And, you know, Carl, when when Carl sent me the invitation, I guess in December, to, to be here to speak with you, 
he included a couple of uh, scenarios, like so you're working with uh, difficult families, for instance, or obviously a difficult family, but challenging. Um, if you might think of one of those scenarios and what do you think that the person, uh, you know, one of the family members is feeling when they're angry? Um, it would be really great if if some of you or a couple of you had a, a specific example that we could look at because the the role playing of it or just, you know, looking at it from this perspective is uh, can be quite powerful. Maybe jump in with one Rochelle while other people. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So I very often work in long term care home supporting teams um, around a variety of things, including communication. But something that's brought, been brought up with me, and I'd be curious to hear your perspective, is sometimes um, when there are issues um, around a person who's living in long term care that they might not be happy with the food, right? That, you know, and, and um, the team is feeling kind of locked in to making sure that the, that the resident is getting healthy food, but the family um, or the family's locked into it, you know, that, so they're not on the same page. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some, some tension or conflict between uh, the team at the home and the families around, it could be dietary needs. It could be about going to activities mm -hmm. that, the, that team members are trying to get the person to an activity and the person's not wanting to go. And then the family's feeling upset. Mm -hmm. So there's challenge around communicating with those issues. Mm -hmm. So which one do you want to go with? We'll choose one. <laughs> I don't know. Is there one that appeals to you more? That like oh, they're all yeah. <laughs> no, which one is most Let's alive? The for activities. You? I hear a lot about activities. That okay, um, activities. So is it you're talking to a family member now, or who, talking who to would... a family member? You know, some adult children who are upset that their mother's no longer making it to the activities that she was once going to. Okay. It feels like the team's not trying hard enough. They're not doing enough yeah. to get their mother to yeah. the activity. Yeah. So how do you think this person is feeling when they're telling you that? You know, I, I'm happy to play that role. Just say, hey, you know, how come my mother isn't, uh, you know, you know, I asked her if she's, if she's going to uh, any art classes, we'll say. I don't know what the activities are or, or fitness. She says she's, she's not going. I know that you have to kind of persuade her, but what's happening there so so tara how would you guess the person to be uh feeling i think the family's feeling frustrated or worried yeah so yeah. yeah so that that i mean that would be the route i would take i would say are are you feeling worried because you want to trust that your mom is being well cared for mm -hmm. and you also want her to be uh actively engaged as much as possible yeah like what is the matter with you people so I don't know what would be the next thing like uh, I'm I'm trying to imagine how that would unfold but I'm going to give an empathic response you see that the hardest thing is don't you all want to get defensive hey we're trying as hard as we can plus we're short-staffed well, and whatever our reasons for not being, plus I can't make somebody do something who doesn't want to do it. Your mom doesn't want to go and I'm not going to make her. Okay, okay but that's not going to connect us. It just creates more frustration. So yeah, the defensiveness is very prevalent. So yeah, are are you feeling are you feeling concerned? Are you feeling frustrated because you want to trust your mom's getting the best possible care? Yeah. yeah. Would you go to the request from there? Would you be willing to come up with a I would wait to hear what they say back to them because the thing is we can be don't be quick to go to solution. Mm. Establish connection before you go to solution. We might not even know what the issue is because uh, I would want to know, is it because the mom is actually not wanting to go? Is it because she's nowhere to be found when we're, uh, when we're gathering people together? Um, is it because we just don't have time and we just rely on people to uh, take responsibility to get to the activities? Uh, you know, what's happening? So I want to be able to, you know, improve the situation. But 
I'm, I'm going to say here too, one of the hardest things I, I have found, and I would say that over, it's been decades now of me teaching, um, people's sense of entitlement has only gone up. The, the, I don't know what the tonal quality is of the person who you're speaking to, but it can be so often colored by a sense of entitlement. It, it's just in the attitude. It's, it's, they probably, it would be so much easier, wouldn't it, if someone came to you and said, I just want to start off by saying how much I appreciate everything that you do to uh, make my mom's days a good days. And, and I also want to say that I'm becoming increasingly concerned because she's not attending the classes or whatever it is that I think would be really good for her. Okay. That's, that's a much different way to approach a person that's connecting with you. <laughs> and wouldn't that feel great? But that's often not what happens. The person is like, do you realize we are paying this amount of money if, if there's money involved, whatever it is. And, you know, I don't understand why you people can't, you know, I'm going to say you people and I'm going to load it. <laughs> so um, and then it makes it so hard for you because the defenses come up so quickly. Part of it is, you know, there's a quote by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow where he said, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we should find in each person's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. And I, I like to tweak that a little bit just to say, you know, if we could read the secret life of anybody, we should find in each person's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. These are very difficult times. And an end of life is extremely difficult. Our culture isn't really, uh, I would say, set up for it, or it, there's so much individuation or individuality, sorry, this, the, the, everybody doing things their way, everybody having their opinions. Um, it, it gets in the way of us having anything really cohesive as a culture that we practice. I, I was watching a video today, it was just a, a brief one about the Hadza hunter gatherer tribe. And they were asked the question, what is the most important thing in life? And this is a hunter gatherer tribe in Tanzania. And I think there's less than 2000 people remaining in the tribe. What is the most important thing in life? Now that's a pretty big question, isn't it? The answer was this, Meat, honey, and corn porridge, as well as hunting for zebras and baboons. That is the most important thing in life. So you can, you hear there's something very different happening there. So the way we do things here is not universal. As much as needs are universal, our way of understanding life, our way of understanding death, our way of uh, understanding what, you know, what does it mean to be a culture? What does it mean to be responsible or honor elders? All of this stuff is, is up for grabs. So then we're talking about uh, how then can I speak to you and make sure that there, we have some human contact across these lines of, uh, of of opinions and entitlement. Yeah, and I think what I hear you saying, Rochelle, is like, even if we come in hot, right, to a conversation, we're coming in with some of our stories or some of our misconceptions, or even if we come in hot, if we're, if we're applying the MBC process well, we're following this formula mm -hmm. that it will help us sort of change the way that we're, you know, the way that we're expressing ourselves, even if we're feeling hot, if we're using this language, hopefully it's not being, hopefully the the judgment is coming out of language enough that we could have a meaningful conversation. Yeah. Conversation. Yeah. Yeah. 
Is it okay if I go to the chat box and share some of what's there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Please okay. do. Excellent. Um, let me just expand it here so I could see. Um, so there was, I'm going to go back a little bit. Um, there was a comment. Um, difficult family is a term I love for healthcare. A resident patient or client is lucky when they have someone with them to support and advocate or whatever uh, for whatever the person needs. Of course, we all have experienced a challenging situation where a family or friend is present. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so just, I guess that's judgmental language, right? Difficult family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a little couple of comments about how defensiveness is prevalent in the workplace. Um, sometimes it's a matter of information. The family member just doesn't know what's happening or why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A comment about uh, an agreement that some family members can be very defensive when you're trying to explain things. Mm -hmm. um, a lack of appreciation. Um, agreement with your quote. And then a comment, sometimes I see I see the quilt in family members for placing their loved one in long term. Oh, the guilt, I think. Sorry, it was a cute yes. mm. Sometimes I see the guilt in family members for placing their loved one in long term care. So they think and say what they think. They think and say what they think they believe, what's best for their loved one, even not really knowing what the resident wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a lot of emotions I, is what I think. There's I there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, at that particular time, it's uh, it's very, uh, very heightened. I, I would like to read an excerpt to you from the book, Nonviolent Communication, because it applies to. Um, I'll just I'll just read it. A wife connects with her dying husband. A patient has just been diagnosed with an advanced state of lung cancer. The following scene at his home involving a visiting nurse, the patient and his wife represents a last opportunity for him to connect emotionally with his wife and discuss his dying before being admitted to the hospital. The wife begins the conversation with the nurse by complaining about the physical therapist who was part of the home health care team assigned to her husband's care. So I'm figuring this is something you're all going to be able to relate to. The wife, she's a bad therapist. The nurse, are you feeling annoyed and wanting to see a different quality of care? She doesn't do anything. She made him stop walking when his pulse got high. Is it because you want your husband to get better that you're scared if the physical therapist doesn't push him, he won't get stronger? And she starts to cry. Yes, I'm so scared. The nurse says, are you scared of losing him? She says, yes, we've been together so long. The nurse says, are you worrying about how you would feel? when he dies. I just can't imagine how I'm going to live without him. He's always been there for me, always. So you're sad when you think of living without him. Yeah, there's no one else besides him. He's all I have, you know, my daughter won't even talk to me. It sounds like when you think of your daughter, you feel frustrated because you wish you had different a different relationship with her. Yes, I wish I did, but she's such a selfish person. I don't know why I even bothered having kids. A lot of good it does me now. You see how much comes up at this time, right? The nurse says, it sounds to me like you might be somewhat angry and disappointed because you want more support from the family during your husband's illness. He's so sick. I don't know how I'm going to get through this alone. I don't have anyone not to talk to not even to talk to, except with you here, now. Even he won't talk to me. Look at him. He doesn't say anything. The nurse says, are you sad, wishing the two of you could support each other and feel more connected? The wife says, yes. Can you talk to him the way you talk to me? The nurse says, are you wanting him to be listened to in a way that helps him express what he's feeling inside? 
yes, yes, that's exactly it. I want him to feel comfortable talking and I want to know what he's feeling. So the nurse turns to the husband. How do you feel when you hear what your wife has shared? He says, I really love her. The nurse says, are you glad to have an opportunity to talk with her about this? He says, yes, we need to talk about it. The nurse says, would you be willing to say how you're feeling about the cancer? He says, not very good. The nurse says, are you scared about dying? No, not scared. Do you feel angry about anything? Do you feel angry about dying? No, not angry. The nurse says, well, I'm puzzled about what you may be feeling and wonder if you can tell me. He says, I reckon I'm thinking how she'll do without me. You see, he doesn't talk about feelings there, but, but it's a lot of feeling is present. The nurse says, oh, are you worried she may not be able to handle her life without you? Yes, I'm worried she'll miss me. Missing someone is a skill, eh? So it's a deep skill. Do you want to hear how your wife feels when you say that? And the husband says, yes. And then this ends. Here the wife joins the conversation in the continued presence of the nurse. The couple begins to express themselves openly to each other. In this dialogue, the wife begins with a complaint about the physical therapist. However, after a series of exchanges during which she felt empathically received, she's able to determine that what she really seeks is a deeper connection with her husband during this critical stage of their lives. I thought that would be an important piece to share with you because in the environment that you're in, I would imagine that what presents itself it isn't really getting to what's alive in the person. It's such a, a scary time. Um, you know, there's the person and you may never see them again. You, you know that day is coming, you just don't know when exactly, and nor do you know how you will respond to that. So it requires a lot of, um, uh, you know, humility and, and also courage to, and risk taking to be able to enter into a conversation like this. But this required someone with some skillfulness in this muscle, the tongue to be able to know that human beings are longing for this and yet it's so frightening. Many, many people die without saying what they would have liked to have said. And many people still living have loved ones die without having conversations like this. Yeah. Uh, yes, the nurse was trained in, in MVC in this, uh, somebody asked in the chat, yeah. So that's a, I, I think that I really appreciate that particular example. So there's a script, you you can hear it at the very beginning, you know, are you feeling angry because you, you, you want to hear, you're afraid of how you'll be without your husband, or you're sad, you're worried. That's the script, but then it leads into something. And there's also the tonal quality. Are you ready and prepared to hear what the person will say? Because it evokes our own humanity in in moments like that yeah so i'll leave it open does anybody have anything they want to ask or say your comments of appreciation michelle around the example mm -hmm. yeah the presentation more generally Mm hmm Yeah. How many hours of practice does it take to become as skilled as the nurse in this example? Um, I don't I don't really know, but I would say um, 
I can tell based on my own experience of, uh, you know, becoming a, a skilled myself, you'd be amazed at what you can achieve in its six months. I, I would give it that, but it it is very much a way of thinking. So it's, it's a fascinating uh, strategy, I would say, NVC. It's like it, co it goes to the language. So it has you change your language so you can change your mind instead of changing your mind so you can change your language. So you, you start speaking this way, recognizing, okay, I have to be very clear about, is this, is this an, an observation? Um, is, is this a, an actual feeling? Is it a need? Um, and the empathy piece, what is alive in that other person? So my way of doing it was after I met Marshall, I just started running the mantra of feelings and needs. That's what I started doing. Yeah. The other thing that I also do and I continue to do is to recognize that uh, people are so complex, so unique, so different. And to, to maintain a sense of curiosity and to be very careful to not become bitter and cynical, which is so easy to do in this time. It is because it life is so hard. It can beat you down so hard. So to maintain a, a, a quality of, of openness or porousness or uh, softness and kindness, you know, when at times you yourself are just struggling to get through the day, um, it, it, it requires a lot. Um, another thing that I, I encourage is poetry. I'm big on poetry because that kind of language is uh, the poet, David White, who some of you may be, uh, familiar with, he would say, poetry is the language against which we have no defenses. And, you know, I actually pulled out a couple of, uh, poems. Let me see if I can, and they were from, oh Yeah. There's a set that a dear friend of mine gave me, and it's called, it's a set of cards, Death's Door, Awake to the Mystery, Poem Cards on the Theme of Death. Are you able to see that? Uh, that I've, That's all I've got here. I don't know who made them. They just came wrapped up in, there's, there's a whole stack. So these are all poems. And, you know, in your places of work and where people are, in fact, you know, where you do have patients and families coming, it would be great to have on the wall some poems for people to see, because it's a way of, of uh, just reminding people, oh, yeah, there's, there's my agenda, there's kind of the, the, the treadmill that I'm on, but then there's also this enormous, vast mystery that right now is so close to claiming someone I love. You know, so just to remember that it, life is so big. And uh, I pulled this one here and it's called, uh, it's from Any Day Now by Leah Browning. I want to remember at least once more the scent of the lemon tree in the backyard and the view of the shoreline on a windy day and everything else I've ever seen in this world, which is so frightening and so wondrous. It's hard to be cynical after you read this. So I'm always alert to the fact that there's a lot out there that's that claims our attention, that draws us away from our deep humanity. And there are, you, you have to set up some practices for yourself uh, to be able to remain human. And NBC is, is one strategy. There, there are many, but I, I do find it one of the most profound strategies in terms of the linguistics. And if you listen to Marshall Rosenberg deliver, you'll, I, I think you'll gain an appreciation for just how powerful this is. And I'm hoping I, I've given you a little glimpse of that in the, the time that we have together or that we've had together, right? It's coming to an end, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, yes, I can hold up the cards again. You see that? 
and I don't know how many there are, but uh, I have a feeling that my friend got this maybe like at a Christmas craft fair or something like that, because it was just, it's a stack of cards and it came wrapped in a little ribbon here. But it's very good to to have cards like this to just reflect on and to bring you back. It's kind of like a tuning fork, you know, that helps you remember the part of yourself. Um, so David White, uh, somebody put that as a question mark. The poem that I just read was uh, by Leah Browning. But David White is a, a wonderful poet as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I and see. all of these poems that I have here, this deck is full of poems from uh, many different artists and writers. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I feel like <laughs> I'm so uh, grateful for the time I've spent with you, but I also appreciate, recognize that I've given you like so much, <laughs> so little in terms, I've given you this much and it's so little in terms of, what the whole scope of this is. Yeah. But uh, I'm grateful for your presence and your willingness to uh, to be here and engage. I see Thank you. Well. Well. I was I was Googling the cards quickly as you were, but I can't find them. So you might. Yeah, have I have a feeling. <laughs> yeah, I have a feeling they're kind of like a handmade item. So crafty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's well, thank I you think. for telling us about them, though. Now we could all sort of keep our eyes open for something that might. You can make <laughs> your right. own, too. Possible, It'll... yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of death uh, poetry out there. Mary Oliver has some beautiful mm -hmm. poetry. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. If someone's oh, asking. The, the link, link to the five-day five workshop. So, RochelleLamb.com. If you go there. Um, you'll see that uh, it's uh, it's happening in May and it's uh, on uh, at Holly Hawk, which is a retreat center here um, on Vancouver Island. And I'd love to see you. It, it might be one of the last ones that I do. I, I every year I kind of go, oh, I don't know if I can do this again. It's it's one of my favorite places to teach. It's very beautiful. If you've never been to BC, come out this way. It would be great to see you. Yeah. Excellent. This was wonderful. Thank you, Rochelle, for sharing your expertise You're, and your passion. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for, uh, yeah, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. And, yeah. and also, thank you. Like the work that you do, it, it's so important. Anyone who's working with, you know, birth and death, I, they're just, they're just so, so important and crucial. I know how difficult that work has got to be. And I, I don't think you get enough appreciation for it. So uh, I just want to know, you don't know, I see you, I see you and I uh, thank you for your fine work. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much again. And thanks to everyone for joining us here. We'll have another session next month in in february so we'll send out an email reminder again for that uh for that topic for that session next time bye man. all right yeah nice to meet you bye. have a good one thanks, thanks so much for hosting carl thank you yeah